Rigdon. Such manipulation is typical not only for religions, but for many occult societies as well. The Latin word occultus means hidden. In the overwhelming majority of cases, such societies attract those who yearn to possess supernatural powers to satisfy their egoism. By the way, if people pay attention to the history of development of aggressive secret societies which seek to achieve absolute power, they will notice that even the names of many of them are connected with the images of the right and the left essences. For example, the secret societies of the dragon, jaguar, leopard, tiger, and wolf. Moreover, their mystical foundation is made up of the rituals related to the right and the left essences. The gist of these rituals is to endow a person with the characteristics and supernatural power of whichever aggressive beast is honored in this society. It is the personal choice of members of such societies that plays the dominant role here, as well as their ideological or religious faith and ancient magical techniques for using the capabilities of the right and the left essences, which as a rule are known only to the leaders of such a secret society. This is one of the numerous examples of how spiritual knowledge was usurped by individuals and began to be used in a perverted version for the purpose of attaining earthly power and personal material goals. As the ancients said, a slave has only one master, whereas a power-loving person has as many masters as there are people who contribute to his rise in earthly power and spirits who contribute to the downfall of his soul. Anastasia I'm convinced once again how important it is that the majority of people understand who is who in this world, are able to distinguish the true spiritual from material substitution, the truth from a lie, good from evil. Rigdon Yes, humanity would then have more chances to avoid disastrous consequences for the civilization in general. After all, rules of the game in the material world, including those for occult societies, are based on the choice of mankind itself, or rather its majority. Various occult powers only provoke or initiate certain actions, that is, they only launch a program of this or that will, but it is people themselves who make these programs a reality of their own choosing by performing corresponding actions and by spending on it the time of their transient lives and the force intended for the salvation of their soul. And in order to be able to distinguish between the truth and falsehood in the world, one must work on oneself, keep track of one's thoughts and control them, and learn to see the world from the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature. Many people who are searching for the spiritual do not even understand that the system of the archons directs their mind in a totally opposite direction, making them spend years and energy on material temporary comforts instead of the real salvation of the soul. As it stands today, unfortunately, most people choose the reign of the animal mind which has seduced them with material desires. They unconsciously make its will a reality with their erroneous choice of what is transient and meaningless, and with their own hands, support and strengthen the power of the archons. Look what is being popularized in the world. What substitutions take place? There are numerous signboards and slogans all around which induce multiple material desires and stimulate the ego. But a person is actually chasing not after material acquisitions, but rather after the sensation of possessing this illusion and the desire to achieve the long-awaited stability in his inner world. However, this stability depends solely on the inner work on yourself, on your spiritual self-perfection, and not on external circumstances. Here is a simple example. Close your eyes and imagine that you have everything. 
palaces, corporations, power over people, and then open your eyes, look around, and you will understand that this was an illusion that has ended very quickly. Life will also fly by in the same way, and everything will end very quickly. So is it worth burdening your own soul for the sake of this illusion and condemning yourself to a lengthy agony after death and to torment for centuries in the form of a bundle of negative emotions which you yourself have created in yourself while chasing after illusions of the animal nature? Suffice it to take a look at the world around us. What substitutions the animal mind creates for those who seem to want to move in the direction of spiritual self-perfection while at the same time wishing for material things. For the most part, these people are unstable in their intention and their spiritual impulses are easily redirected into the channel of material interests. Note what such people seek in their everyday lives and what they pay attention to assigning to it the status of top priority in their day. Some are preoccupied with strengthening their personal influence on people, asserting their own significance, and profiting from spiritual knowledge. Others are busy cleansing their bodies, arguing themselves hoarse about vegetarianism. Still others are focused on losing weight or practicing different health improvement systems, with selfish ambitions and empty inner content. Some people cling to sects or religious movements, once again delighting their ears with false promises of resurrection in their beloved bodies. Others meditate, attracting wealth, luck, happiness, and health. Some, because of the domination of the animal nature and out of foolishness, begin to consider themselves enlightened and competent in many spiritual matters, to combine different meditation techniques they know, mixing the sinful with the righteous. And what is the basis of all this? Pridefulness and affirmation of personal significance in the three-dimensional world, a secret desire of power over someone. Anastasia Yes, substitutions today take place on a global scale. Suffice it to look at what particular psychotechniques are being promoted in society and popularized by the world media in order to confirm this for yourself. After all, these are mostly the usual methods of archons, so to say, meditations for the masses to attract material benefits. The sad thing is that most people do not even ask themselves why precisely such a material trend is being cultivated. Why is no money being spared to promote such ideas, buying the necessary expert opinions of globally known people? Why do these ideas revolve around pleasing one's beloved body and creating comfort around oneself and the egoistic little world of a self-lover? The answer is simple, so that a person would imitate this behavior and spend time and energy of his life on, roughly speaking, a tastier banana, and at the same time, so that his hair is glossy and shining. However, like in any deception, nobody explains what consequences await the person later after he has wasted his life like a silly monkey on the search of a tasty banana and his beloved body will simply die, just like any animal. But he, as a personality, will not escape from his sufferings and will have to pay too high a price for the wasted life. And what is daily spiritual work on yourself? First of all, it is the habit of controlling your own thoughts and not judging other people's thoughts. Man, as a rule, often notices manifestations of the animal nature in another person, but does not bother to pay equally careful attention to himself, does not try to come to know his own reactions to internal and external provocations of the animal nature, and does not find it necessary to work hard on himself in each day. Only by changing yourself internally and working on yourself, 
can you understand the real processes of the visible and invisible worlds and consciously walk the spiritual path? In other words, inner changes must be, first of all, in the person himself. This is the meaning of his spiritual development. Everything else is secondary. The body should certainly be taken care of just like any other machine, but only for the purpose of reaching the goal. No more than that. It is necessary to know and keep in view the true goal of your life, which is spiritual liberation. This is the most important thing for any person. When man begins to know himself, he begins to learn about the complexity of his structure and its purpose. One can say that everything helps a person to make his conscious choice and become a new spiritual being. An important role in this transformation is played by his four main essences. Anastasia Yes, different nations of the world have quite a lot of information recorded in various rituals, mystic practices, and sacred legends regarding the four essences and the spiritual center. Incidentally, according to different stories, Every nation would place these four essences, orienting the front essence towards a certain part of the world. Could you explain this point to the readers? Why did people who inhabited different parts of the globe have their own understanding of this orientation? Rigdon Generally speaking, the orientation of these four essences, according to cardinal directions, assigning a particular color to them, and so on, depended on local traditional preferences, customs, and common beliefs of this or that people, which were formed for centuries based on the sacred folk tales of their ancestors. For instance, the Chinese considered the South to be the most honorable cardinal direction, so they placed the symbols that corresponded to the front essence towards the South. For shamans of the northern peoples of Siberia, the main direction where they turned their faces, the front essence, during the performance of rituals was usually the north, whereas for shamans of the southern and the eastern nations of Asia, it was the south or the east. The Indians of Mesoamerica regarded east or west as the main cardinal direction depending on local traditions of certain tribes. In general, where a person traditionally turns his face while doing a spiritual practice, a religious ritual, ceremony, and so on, is where his front essence is. Certainly, while reading ancient myths, one should understand where there is folklore and where there is real knowledge, because many superficial, confusing things from the human mind were added with time, mainly as a result of a literal understanding of associative examples. But nevertheless, even today, one can find many interesting mentions, including those regarding the secret knowledge about the four essences of a human being. Anastasia Such knowledge can be found in totemic sources and mythological conceptions of the peoples of Europe Asia, Africa, and America. Rigdon. Quite right. In most cases, small nations which live on different continents, as a result of their rather long isolation from contacts with representatives of the civilized society, due to unfavorable climate or inaccessibility of their settlements to travelers, were able to preserve the knowledge of their ancestors. In some sense, this saved them, since the civilization had no idea about the existence of these peoples and their cultures. Consequently, their unique knowledge has not been totally destroyed with fire and sword by the latest new religion that was dominant in the world civilization, as was the case with the ancient knowledge of other peoples. Anastasia Yeah, well, as they say, every cloud has a silver lining. 
But at the same time, now there's an excellent opportunity to compare what once existed in the past with what we have today and to ask ourselves the question why representatives of all the modern religions claim that only they and no one else in the world has spiritual knowledge. If we approach this question objectively and look into it in the state of an expanded perception of the world, it will then become obvious that the knowledge was one and the same everywhere. It's just that people gave different form to it and called it their own. After all, any renewed spiritual teaching was in fact formed consistent with the main secret knowledge that had been given to different peoples in the past. And it is only when priests had altered this knowledge and clothed it into a form of the dominant religion that ideology changed. In fact, they were narrowing perception of the world for nations right up to provoking fanaticism in the masses and thoughtless destruction of the heritage of their ancestors of all that did not conform to the canons of the new religion. Rigdon, undoubtedly. But here's what I want to point out. Despite such work by the priesthood on the destruction of the spiritual heritage of different peoples and indoctrination of new generations with the idea that all the previous beliefs are apostasy and heresy, Basic knowledge about the four essences is present in the secret knowledge of practically all the world religions today. This can be seen from the indirect evidence of what is currently being offered to the masses in the teaching, philosophy, and ideology of this or that religion. It must be understood that priests of any religion will impose on the masses only what is beneficial to them and what will strengthen their power among the people, and not all that knowledge which their predecessors themselves once borrowed from other popular religions. Moreover, priests will never spread among the masses the original spiritual teaching which independently leads a person to spiritual liberation. But it is on the basis of attractive spiritual grains of this teaching that they form one or another religion. When religion itself as an institute of power is formed, much gets reworked in the original teaching and changed for the sake of the religious power of priests. For example, let us take Buddhism. At first sight, while reading the general philosophy of Buddhism, it seems that this world religion puts an emphasis on man's independent cognition of the world and of himself. After all, it presents to the masses a wide variety of practices which lead to enlightenment, and which, by the way, have been formed on the basis of the knowledge of other more ancient religions of India. But this sensation lasts only until you face the realities of today in this religion as well as the priestly structure of this world religion. If a person does not distinguish between the spiritual nature and his animal nature, if he does not see substitutions from the animal mind, it is difficult for him to understand what the catch is and what significant difference there is between, for instance, the original teaching of Buddha and the religion of Buddhism which has, so to speak, appropriated this teaching. So the four essences of a human are mentioned both in the old Indian sacred tradition and in the Buddhist religious interpretation of Buddhist teaching. Among the supreme knowledge in religious teachings about meditation practices in Hinduism and Buddhism are attainment of intuitive knowledge, superconsciousness, In Sanskrit, in the English transcription, it sounds like abhijna, cognition of the world through a special altered state of consciousness, the state of integrity, unity, samadhi. Attainment of intuitive knowledge is interpreted as perception of the truth, the unity of the world, achieving oneness of the five categories, clairvoyance, clairaudience, having supernatural powers, reading other people's thoughts, 
and the memory of past lives. It is mentioned that an accomplished person is capable of influencing this entire material world right up to the seventh dimension, or as the ancient Indian treatises state, right up to the heavens of Brahma. After all, the path to the heavens of Brahma starts with renunciation of attachment to the six worlds of passion of the wheel of life. Anastasia In fact, this oneness of five categories describes the result of work with the four main essences and the center, the personality. As a matter of fact, the result of a certain stage of spiritual work of a person is considered here, when these essences are already under his control and the person approaches the state of leaving the six dimensions. Rigdon Just so. Man, working on himself, changing and perfecting himself in the spiritual direction, achieves certain effects which give him additional capabilities in knowing the world. Anastasia Yes, for instance, in the process of mastering spiritual practices, the personality, the center, acquires the ability of clairvoyance, that is, of contemplation with its inner vision from the perspective of the observer of the spiritual nature, of any existing forms, regardless of distance and time, as well as of seeing the real essence of an event or a phenomenon. That is really so, taking into account even my practical experience of meditation for more than 20 years, and also the experience of those people with whom I had the honor of learning your teaching and that primordial spiritual knowledge which you have communicated. Such clairvoyance assumes, among other things, simultaneous contemplation of an object in different dimensions, understanding the underlying cause of its appearance, transformation, and so on, achieving such a state of intuitive knowledge the person realizes how to control the front essence, which in turn manifests in him the ability to understand and intuitively feel any being from the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature and also to make contact with it, regardless of space and time. Rigdon That is correct. In the religious interpretation of Buddhism, this is referred to as acquiring divine hearing, clairaudience, which allows one to understand people who speak unknown languages and to hear sounds of the world, even at great distances. The thing is that the sound, according to Indian mythology, is a kind of a symbol connected with cosmic rhythms. The one listening to the sounds of the world is the one who knows them and who is able to extract cosmic rhythms. It is believed that everything is interconnected and is permeated with subtle cosmic vibrations. By changing himself and his small sphere, man makes changes in the bigger realm. Anastasia Well, basically, yes, the person who judges phenomena of the world within the limits of thinking of a resident of three-dimensional space, will perceive it as acquiring divine hearing. Indeed, the knowledge about the four essences is reflected in Buddhist philosophical teachings, although in somewhat embellished form. But still, even if we consider the above-mentioned categories, clairvoyance, clairaudience, possession of supernatural powers, reading other people's thoughts, and memory of past lives, it turns out that each of them points at the capabilities of a particular essence. I can judge about this by the practical experience of our group. For example, when we were learning the tunneling meditation technique, which involved work with the back essence, we were actually able to learn about our past and even partially read information about the past lives of our sub-personalities. In the Buddhist philosophy, the acquisition of memory of past lives 
implies knowledge of your past births and memory of your previous temporary states. Regarding the capabilities of the left and right essences, in our time we had a very good illustrative example, namely the spiritual work of those four warriors whom you were teaching the art of the Gellier warrior. That was when I realized how a person's control over the left essence reveals in him such abilities as knowing and reading other people's thoughts. By and large, this is not only revelation of such abilities, but also the perception of structures of the subtle world through feelings and also exercising influence through them. I clearly saw how restraining the right essence with a strict control of your thoughts and certain meditation practices leads to influencing the coarse structures of the world and to the opening of certain supernatural powers, which in fact are a side effect acquired in the course of spiritual development. But most of all, I was impressed by the spiritual fortitude of this group of four. The acquisition of excellent professional skills did not shake their spiritual intentions, which unfortunately cannot be said about some people with whom I had to work in subsequent groups. Of course, there were different situations, including the ones that brought enlightening learning experience. For instance, two years of hard work of my group gave concrete results, but this also exposed the fact that some people from the group, in fact, were not ready to reveal such phenomenal abilities in themselves. Their consciousness was taken over by momentary success, a sense of their own importance and pridefulness. They started to secretly dream of their prospects related to the human world. In general, an imbalance in favor of the animal nature started. And the main thing is that sincerity was lost as well as the desire of achieving specifically the spiritual goal. There simply began verbal hiding behind noble intentions against the background of evident attacks from the animal nature. Even a small success, in fact, triggered their loss of control over the animal nature. But at the same time, this was a good lesson for those who are able to recognize their mistakes and who adhere firmly to the spiritual direction. Such an experience grants the opportunity to walk the spiritual path in a more mature and conscious way afterwards. Rigdon In fact, while going through the stage of learning the right and the left essences, instead of gaining control over them, a person runs the risk of getting under control of these very clever essences if he is tempted by the desire to possess invisible power and control over other people, and as a consequence of getting carried away with it and wasting the rest of his life on achieving a temporary result, having thus lost the opportunity of his liberation, of escape from the circle of reincarnations. This is a kind of a trap for people who hesitate in their main choice. In this regard, there is an interesting parable about a treasure hunt. Once upon a time, a wise man was passing by a village. He told the villagers there that countless treasures were hidden under the ground directly below their main square. Whoever finds them will gain not only wealth, but also they will never be the same again. The villagers rejoiced at this news. There was much debate and lengthy discussions, but finally the residents decided to dig up the treasures together. Armed with tools, they began to dig. However, after a while, when they still had no expected results from their labor, the villagers' enthusiasm began to fade. The first people to abandon the excavations were the ones who talked a lot. Rather than actually doing anything themselves to find the treasures, they only tried to tell others how they should work. These were followed by people who quickly became exhausted by this hard work. They decided these treasures are not worth all this effort. There were others who started finding pieces of broken tiles, ancient crockery, and old coins. 
they hid what they had found from the rest, thinking these were the real treasures, and soon they had left the site too. Other people simply enjoyed the experience of the treasure hunt. They believed that these feelings of joy from the search must be the treasures promised by the wise men. Eventually, as time dragged on and only mud and rocks were strewn around them, their joy evaporated. So they turned their backs on this task, for they proved to be just too weak in spirit. As time went on, many of the remaining people started to doubt the possibility of success in their search. They began thinking that they had become prey to some deception or a mere myth. The villagers started leaving the treasure hunt site one by one, and only those few who were fixed on the goal, who worked diligently and hard, found their treasures in the end. But after they had found the treasures, none of them was seen in this village again, and those villagers who had participated in the treasure hunt but had not found the treasure for the rest of their lives were preoccupied with self-justification and explanations of why they had not stayed with everyone back then. After all, it had been a chance to change their miserable lives for the better. Some of them spent the rest of their lives wandering in the search of that wise man who had originally revealed the secret of the treasure, hoping they could find out what the treasures looked like, where they were now, and how they could be acquired. So, the treasure is the spiritual transformation of man. To achieve it, it is necessary to work hard on yourself each day. Not everyone who is attracted by the prospect of the path reaches the end of it, because the path involves internal changes. The first ones to leave the path are those who talk much but do nothing to transform themselves. They are followed by those who look for easy victories. Then. Those who are tempted by the abilities that have opened up in them to satisfy their significance in this world also stray from the spiritual path. They are followed by those who find pleasure in the very process of searching for the meaning of life but do not understand themselves, and as a result, they find nothing. Finally, those who doubt themselves and the sage that revealed the spiritual truth to them and who even doubt the truth itself, also walk away from the spiritual path. All these people interpret the spiritual path in some way which benefits them in this material world. It is only those who walk with pure and sincere intentions right to the end, persistent in their spiritual labor, transforming themselves in each day, Only they find their spiritual treasures in life that make it possible for them to leave for another world. The parable teaches us that quite often, while following the spiritual path, people are merely seeking personal successes in this temporary for them world instead of seeking their spiritual treasures, which open to them a way to eternity. Anastasia Yes, this is the truth of life, which was important not only in ancient times, but also now. Everyone makes their own choice. 